Welcome to another episode of Around the County with Supervisor Jim Desmond. I'm Miles Himmel, Communications Director for District 5, and we're doing something a little different. I know we've done some COVID uh, conversations lately. Uh, we're, we're, we'll still do COVID, but we've heard enough of it for right now, so we wanted to kind of sw switch gears and bring something that's pretty pertinent here in San Diego County. Uh, you've heard Supervisor Desmond talk about the new SANDAG plan for $177 billion. Uh, we wanted to bring on uh, an expert, Randall O'Toole from the Cato Institute. Uh, Randall's written many books, uh, studied public transportation, and, and in fact, Randall, that's kind of my first question. How did you get into this realm, if you don't mind? Well, for one thing, I love trains. And so I've always been fascinated by trains. And when cities started building rail transit, I took a look at it and realized, it was a giant boondoggle. And even though I love trains, I didn't want other people to have to subsidize my particular hobby. I don't think that's fair at all. Uh, so I look at intercity trains, I look at urban transit, uh, I look at the land use issues that are associated with them. And I find that there's a lot of uh, uh, wishful thinking among urban planners and transportation planners that if they just design things the right way, people will use what they design rather than what they don't want to design, which is automobiles and highways. What, why do you think that is? What, what, what's your idea? What's your thoughts on that? Well, there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, first of all, uh, urban planners, a lot of them remember the days when uh, cars were gas hogs and our skies were so filthy, you couldn't see 10 miles in, in major cities. And you know there were uh, 55,000 deaths per year in automobile accidents. And they haven't really noticed that we have greatly reduced or even solved those problems. Uh, the new cars built today per, per emit only 1% as much pollution as cars built set 50 years ago. Uh, they use half as, less than half as much gasoline, and uh, f fatality rates, highway f fatality rates have gone down by 75%. So we're solving or we have solved those problems, and yet they still want to demonize the automobile. Another thing that's going on is I think some people have a, a, a belief that if we use collective transportation that we're somehow going to be better off psychologically, that we're going to be more sympathetic to people of different diverse backgrounds than if we are in our cars all the time. Uh, I, I don't think that's rational. I don't think it's realistic. Uh, there's no indication that Americans 100 years ago uh, were more tolerant when they were using mass transit a lot more than they are today, that they were more tolerant of different races or different uh, religions or different things like that. And yet they have this faith in collectivity over individuality. And I think it's partly a matter of control. If, if everybody is forced to use transit, then they can only go where you want them to go when you want them to go there. Whereas with automobiles, we have 4 million miles of roads in this country you can go almost anywhere you want to go. If you've got the right type of vehicle, you can even go off-roads in a lot of places. And that gives people a freedom and independence that some people kind of resent and don't like. So all these things end up playing a part of it. Of course, the final thing is, if you build a freeway, it costs you maybe $5 million a lane mile. So if you're building a uh, a four lane freeway, that's $20 million a mile. If you build a light rail line right now, the average cost is $200 million a mile. And that light rail line is only gonna carry about a third as many people as one freeway lane. So we're talking about enormous amounts of money. And when you're talking about government spending enormous amounts of money, there's gonna be a lot of people out there who are gonna say, yes, I wanna make some of that money so send the contracts to me. And so yeah. they end up financing the political campaigns, both for uh, politicians who support these ideas and ballot measures when they come on the ballot to ask people to vote for these kinds of ideas. Ooh. And so we have a, uh, uh, on one hand, a, a, a misrepresentation of, of the evilness of the automobile, 
And on the other hand, we have enormous amounts of money going into claiming that rail transit is somehow a good idea and somehow solves these problems when in fact it's totally obsolete. Well, there there comes a point, and and I'm you know of, of the same opinion with you, uh, Randall, on the on these issues. But you know we can only pave over so much. You know you, there there comes a point where you know putting four more lanes on the freeway, and and I'm a freeway guy actually. Uh, you know think uh, I'm trying to get HOV lanes at least uh, for us in North County, San Diego, uh, put in. I'm okay with you know mass transit in the urban areas. You know downtown San Diego or or in your case in Oregon, downtown Portland, places like that, but it doesn't work everywhere. And, and what I'm trying to do is make sure we have a regional system that doesn't put mass transit everywhere. And, and you're right, the, the car, I think, has evolved so much, uh, you know, with hopefully new fuels are becoming out, new types of engines, and, and making them more and more efficient and, and less polluting, which is kind of the, everybody has to the greenhouse gas is the buzzword now that we have to reduce them, which I'm fine with. I think we need to clean up the air. But what's kind of the solution? I mean, if if, um, if not transit, um, you know, I, I think technology is going to play a big role. What, do you have any points on a technology with, with automobiles that you want to make? Well, the, the transit industry has done a very good job of using a very persuasive technique to get people to support their ideas that persuasive technique is known as lying. One of the big lies they use is the claim that one rail line can move as many people as an eight lane freeway. And sometimes they even go as far as saying a 16 lane freeway or more than that. The reality is there are almost no rail lines in this country that move as many people as one freeway lane in an urban area. Uh, a single freeway lane in Los Angeles moves an enormous number of cars, an enormous number of people a day. The, that's the most productive freeway system in terms of people per day that we have in the country. But New York freeways, uh, compared to the New York subway, the subways barely move as many people as one freeway lane in New York. And everywhere else, it's far, far less. So if you're concerned about land use and you want to make most efficient use of land, well, highways make a much more efficient use of land because they can move more people per hour uh, than, than rails by far. If you can get people out of their cars and onto transit, well, buses can move far more people than rails. There's a bus rapid transit system in Istanbul that can move 30,000 people per hour. That's as many people as the Washington DC subway. It's about four times as many people as the San Diego trolley can move per hour. Hmm. There's a bus rapid transit system in Bogota, Colombia that can move 50,000 people per hour. That's more people per hour than the New York City subway system. And it's five to 10 times as many people per hour as any light rail line in the country. So if you want to be really efficient and you can get people to ride transit, buses are by far the most efficient way to go. They can move more people per hour. They do it at a lower cost. They can do it more safely and they're more flexible. Uh, they can go off the bus rapid transit line and go into neighborhoods and circulate around and trains can't do that. And uh, uh, they're also uh, 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 <clears throat> far cheaper than, than rails by far, both to operate and to, uh, uh, and to start up. So buses actually rendered rail systems obsolete in 1927. That was the year the first buses were, to, were uh, introduced into the market that had the motors over the rear wheels instead of sticking out in front in a big hood. So they could move more people per hour. They could do it uh, more cheaply per passenger mile uh, than any rail line. And so after 1927, <clears throat> transit systems around the country rapidly replaced their rail transit with buses. Huh. Well, one of the in San Diego County, we have about currently pre COVID, uh, actually, pre COVID, we had about 3%, 3.5% of the people using transit in San Diego County. 
And now they're claiming with this new big plan that's going to be $177 billion, which has a lot of rail and underground and tunnels and everything else, um, that they're going to get to 10% of the people using transit, which to me is just a huge amount of money for, for, for that. And, and it's going to come from people using roads. The money is they're going to put, tax you to, to even get on a free, we, freeway lane and things like that. They're all going to be toll lanes. I mean, 90% of the people are still going to be on the roads. So to me, and it always seems to be that transit's for other people. I want them out of my way on the freeway, so I'm willing to support transit, but I'm never going to use it. Somebody else is. It seems to be the attitude of, of a lot of people that support it. Well, as The Onion famously wrote years ago, 98% of American commuters support other people riding transit. That's it. Uh, but... <clears throat> The reality is, let, let me give you a list of all the American cities that have spent a lot of money on transit and significantly increased transit share of travel and reduced automobile share of travel. Okay, that's the list. That's all the American cities that have done it. Instead, what usually happens is the other way around and Los Angeles is the saddest case of all They've spent enormous amounts of money building light rail, and they lose five bus riders for every rail rider they've gained. Why? Because in order to build the rail line, they've had to raise bus fares and cut back on bus service, and uh, it's killed the bus system in, in Los Angeles. Los Angeles used to have one of the best bus systems in the country, and, and it's dying, and, and so they're saying things like, well, it's too easy to get around by car. We need to convert uh, automobile lanes to bus lanes and not allow more automobiles on those lanes and make it more congested. Well, Los Angeles is already the most congested city in the country. It's not too easy to get around by car. And yet, despite that congestion, people don't ride transit because transit is slow. It doesn't go where they want to go. And it's expensive. Randall, do you have, because I know you've written books about uh, public transit and you're, you're an expert in this area. Do you have a couple, uh, because we, you know, like Supervisor Desmond was just talking about here in San Diego, they unveiled the plan, 177 billion. That, that, that you, people can't even comprehend that. Do you have other projects that have gone on with astronomical numbers like that, that, that maybe, maybe haven't come to fruition or haven't turned out like they said? Well, the two that come to mind are Los Angeles, which recently voted to spend $120 billion on transit, and Seattle, which recently voted to spend uh, $55 billion on transit. And those are both on top of the amounts that they were had previously voted uh, to spend. And so, uh, again, I think it comes down to the transit industry being very good at this persuasive technique. They tell people that transit relieves congestion. You know, and people want to believe that, but it doesn't work. It hasn't worked anywhere. There's no indication that congestion has been significantly relieved by transit anywhere, especially by building rail transit. And so uh, it, it ends up being a big lie. Um, so far, neither Los Angeles nor Seattle have finished spending that $120 billion or $55 billion, but we can look at Dallas which has built more than 100 miles of light rail lines. And before they were building it, about 3% of Dallas commuters took transit to work, and now it's down to less than 2%. Uh, we can look at San Diego, which was the pioneer of light rail, built the first modern light rail line in America in 1981. At that time, about 4.5% of commuters took transit to work, and now it's down to about 3%. So, you know, it doesn't work anywhere. Uh, it ends up harming transit riders. We can look at Atlanta and San Francisco, which both built heavy rail systems, which means subways and elevators. And they spent enormous amounts of money, billions of dollars doing it. And they both lost about a third of their per capita transit ridership. Per capita transit ridership actually in, in, uh, in, in, uh, Atlanta has gone down by two thirds, and in San Francisco has gone down by a third since they started building 
of the BART system and the Atlanta MARTA system. So rail transit is a good way of getting people out of buses and into their cars. It's <laughs> not a good way of getting people out of cars and into trains. It doesn't work. They built the BART system and the, and the Atlanta MARTA system. They thought they were going to get people out of their cars and onto rails. And as I say, they got people out of buses and into their cars instead. Cars give people access to far more jobs than transit can do. In most cities, you can reach more jobs in a 20-minute auto drive than you can reach in a 60-minute transit ride. Low-income people have figured that out. Only 5% of low-income San Diegans take transit to work. 95% don't. And how do we pay for transit? We use things like sales taxes and property taxes. Those are regressive taxes. We're asking low-income people to disproportionately pay for transit rides that 95% of them are never going to take. That's not social justice, that's social injustice. So we're trying to make our cities great for the upper middle class and we're putting it on the backs of the lower classes or the working classes and that's not fair. Why, why is it so politically charged that you know, people feel like if I put in transit, I'm doing the right thing? Or, or they, you know, the people that vote for, we need more transit, we need need more people. It's, it, you know, our minorities, like you, you'd mentioned, you know, are in our poor classes, they need it. And that's why we should build it. But, but you're saying it's the opposite that's happening. Well, it's partly because of the transit lobby. The American Public Transportation Association has a budget of more than $20 million a year. Uh, people talk about the highway lobby, but if you add up the budgets of all the highway lobby groups in Washington, D.C., they only come to about $6 million. So the transit has a much bigger budget for lobbying these things and propagandizing these things. And just as an example, everybody takes it for granted that transit is green and cars are brown, that getting people out of cars yeah. and on a transit will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, will save energy. And to do that, we need to build a bunch of rail lines. Well, it turns out it's not true. Uh, transit, on average, uses far more energy per passenger mile. San Diego Transit uses 50% more energy and emits 50, more than 50% more greenhouse gas emissions per passenger mile than cars. Uh, and they do almost 50% uh, more than light trucks. Light trucks are not quite as efficient as cars, but they're still far more efficient than San Diego Transit. There's a lot of light rail lines that yeah. emit far more greenhouse gas emissions and use far more energy than uh, the average car. So uh, transit is the brown form of travel. Automobiles are the green form of travel. If you care about the environment, you should be encouraging people to buy more fuel efficient cars not encouraging people to build more transit, which incidentally, when you build it, you release enormous amounts of greenhouse gases because it takes a lot of fossil fuels to construct anything, uh, or as well as concrete and steel, takes a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions to make the concrete and steel that's used in transit as well. Well, what we're kind of doing in San Diego, we got we hired this new executive director that has these big, bold moves, he's calling them. We're kind of starting over from scratch. I mean, we still have our topography we have to deal with. So if, if you were designing a, a region you know, for Seattle or for San Diego or, or anywhere, what kind of a transportation system would, would be ideal? Is, is there a, a, a certain mix or blend of different options? I mean, what's, what's the best way to go for a, a municipality to try to, I guess, hit the reset button on their transportation system? Well, the, the reality is we have two kinds of infrastructure. We have dumb infrastructure that uses smart vehicles, and we have smart infrastructure that uses dumb vehicles. And the dumb infrastructure always wins because it's easier to improve the smartness of our vehicles than it is to go back and rebuild all the infrastructure to make it smarter 
when you're running dumb vehicles on smart infrastructure. Roads are dumb. You can put pedestrians, bicycles, motorcycles, cars, pickup trucks, SUVs, buses, trucks, uh, you know, giant trucks, uh, motorhomes. You can put all kinds of vehicles on them. And as you make vehicles smarter, you make them more efficient, you, you add things like adaptive cruise control, eventually we'll have driverless cars. Uh, all these things can still be done on the dumb infrastructure. Rails are smart infrastructure. I, I love this analogy. Go ahead, but keep going. Good. It, it's just not an analogy, <laughs> but <laughs> rails are smart infrastructure. You can only put vehicles on them that are designed a certain way. The bar most rail lines in America have rails that are four feet, eight and a half inches apart. The BART line in San Francisco has rails that are five feet apart. So you can't even interchange BART vehicles with uh, other rail vehicles because they aren't the same. And so if you want to make a change to make it more efficient, you have to spend billions of dollars completely rebuilding all of the infrastructure. And that means rails get left behind. You know, if you're moving 100 car freight trains from point A to point B, that's more efficient than moving a truck, but, uh, you know, 100 trucks. But moving passengers, they don't go from point A to point B. They go from 1,000 points of origin to 1,000 destinations, and rails just can't do that. So, so why, uh, why is rail we smart? We want dumb infrastructure for our transportation system, not smart infrastructure. So why, okay, I, I understand roads are dumb. Why, why are the rail smart infrastructure? Well, it's smart because the technology is contained in it because there's only a limited number of vehicles that can use it. You know, you can't safely walk on the railroad tracks. You can't ride your bicycle on the railroad tracks. You can't ride your, drive your motor home on the railroad tracks or, uh, uh, you know, without heavily modifying the vehicles, you can't run a car or, or a pickup truck on it, but you can uh, ride a limited number of vehicles and they're tied into the technology. If it's an electric rail line with overhead wires, then you can only run trains that have the pantographs that reach those overhead wires. That's light rail. Uh, and those kinds of ties make the infrastructure smarter and the vehicles dumber, but it means that you can't readily advance. You can't adapt to new things. If a new technology comes out that's faster, that's cheaper, that's more efficient, it's really hard to adapt smart infrastructure to it. And it's really easy to adapt dumb infrastructure because you're only having to change the vehicles, not the infrastructure. Wow, that's uh, that's quite compelling. The, the, so, what do you say to the people that you know? Cars are bad. We have to get the single occupancy drivers out of their cars and put them into transit, so we have fewer cars on the on the freeways. That's kind of the argument I'm up against uh, in San Diego. Is, is you know, single occupancy vehicles bad? You know, multi occupancy occupancy vehicles good, and and we just have to get fewer cars on the roads. I mean, what what's your answer or response to that? Well, the average uh, bus in San Diego, uh, I have the number right here, um, has 11 people on board. That's, that's quite a few. In many cities, it's only like six or seven. But it's a bus that has room for 60 people or more. So that means only about one out of six uh, places are occupied. If you're driving around in your five passenger Ford Explorer and you're the only occupant, you have a higher occupancy rate in your Ford Explorer than that San Diego bus has on average. Now, there might be times of the day when the bus is, is full and there's other times of the day when there's only two people on it. But the average is less than 11 people on board uh, San Diego buses, and that was in 2018. Now that we're all into social distancing, they won't even let more than 10 people on buses in many cities, so the average is going to be a lot less. So uh, really, a, a single occupancy vehicle is in a lot of cases more fuel efficient, more greenhouse gas friendly 
uh, and, and more land efficient, in other words, you can move more people per uh, unit of land than, than buses, than trains, than a, uh, any kind of mass transportation. Well, Miles, you want to kind of wrap us up here? Yeah, uh, Randall, I appreciate you coming on. Kind of what, but last kind of question for you in this in this world of COVID. Hopefully, we get done with it sometime soon. What is the future of transportation? What is that tipping point? I mean, is it going to be years of spending billions of dollars more, or, or do you have any any hope for the future? Well, we first of all have to recognize that transit has been in decline since 1920, and if the pandemic does anything is merely going to accelerate a decline that was already taking place. In 1920, the average American road transit almost 300 trips a year. Uh, in, 19, in 2019, uh, 99 years later, it was down to about 36 trips per year for the average urban American. Uh, what, what the pandemic is going to do is it's gonna to lead to a lot more people working at home. Businesses have discovered that their people can be just as productive working at home and sometimes more productive, and uh, they can save a lot of money on office space. Maybe they'll still have some office space and ask people to come in one or two days a week, but they don't need to have it be in expensive downtown high rises. They can be in uh, suburban low rises which is actually gonna be more convenient for the people because most people live in suburbs. So we're gonna have a lot more people working at home and that's gonna to lead to a lot less transit ridership. I'm predicting that uh, uh, just because of working at home, 20% of the people who were riding transit are never gonna come back to transit or at least not on a daily basis. They might do it one or two days a week. But uh, is going to work out to be a 20% cut in ridership right there. Beyond that, there's a lot of people saying, I don't want to ride a form of transportation that puts me at risk of catching a virus. And we already had research showing that people who ride transit were almost six times more likely to have acute respiratory infections. Uh, and that was before the, the virus. Uh, we know a lot of people got sick and died before they were uh, wearing masks on transit in, in New York City subways and elsewhere, uh, New York City buses, uh, masks help. But if you have an alternative, why take the risk at all? So we're going to have a lot of people not riding transit just because uh, they don't want to take the risk. So we've got two things going on here. And then the third thing is, if jobs move out of downtown areas because they don't want to be packed in where they're susceptible to viruses and things like that, that's going to reduce transit as well. Transit works for getting people downtown. It doesn't work for getting people anywhere else. So as jobs move away from downtown, as people uh, start working at home, we're, going to, we're probably going to get only up to 50 or 60 percent of transit ridership after the pandemic compared to what it was before the pandemic. Spending more money on transit is a really foolish idea uh, in situations like this. It, like, well, let's go spend some money and make a really efficient manual typewriter uh, because that would really speed things up if we had efficient manual typewriters. Or, or let's make rotary telephones again. Or let's make ice boxes so we don't have to waste electricity on uh, keeping things cold. We'll just put chunks of ice in that we'll have somebody deliver to us all summer long. That's going to be really efficient. You know, <laughs> these are the, that's the kind of technology we're talking about when we're talking about rail transit, which basically hasn't changed in technology in 80 years. All right. Right. I appreciate you coming on and doing this. I um, uh, keep up the good work. Where can, what's, a, what's your latest book where people can find, find out more about you? Well, my latest book is called Romance of the Rails. It's because I love trains. I uh, wrote this book about how wonderful passenger trains and urban rail transit used to be 100 years ago, but why they don't work anymore. Uh, I also have a website. It's called The Anti-Planner. Just go to ti.org and click on anti-planner and I've been publishing a weekly series of policy briefs most of which deal with some kind of transportation issue uh, I'm now up to number 64 
So uh, uh, that's a, I hope will be a great source of information for people. Fantastic. Thank you, Randall. I appreciate your time. Thank you.